Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Miller, and I am the Twin Cities Chapter uh, Co-President of the American Constitution Society. Uh, for those that aren't aware of what the American Constitution Society is, we are the nation's largest progressive legal organization that is dedicated to upholding the Constitution by ensuring that the law is a force for protecting our democracy and for improving people's lives. We are an organization dedicated to shaping the debate on the most important issues of our time that reflect the values of our Constitution. If this is something that you're interested in, we encourage you to become a member and to join us on this endeavor. Uh, I would first off like to thank our many, many co-sponsors, both locally and nationally, including the lawyer chapters of the American Constitution Society from the Bay Area, Chicago, Washington, DC, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, and ACS at large. In addition, I'd like to thank our student chapters of the American Constitution Society, the University of Minnesota, Mitchell Hamlin, St. Thomas, St. Louis, Missouri Columbia, and the University of North Dakota. And a special thanks to our local Infinity Bar Associations, the Twin Cities Diversity and Practice, Minnesota Hispanic Bar Association, the Minnesota Association of Asian Pacific um, uh, Bar Association, the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers, the Somali American Bar Association, the Minnesota Women Lawyers, Minnesota Lavender Bar, and the Minnesota American Indian Bar Association. Thank you all so much for co-sponsoring us and joining us for this event today. Uh, as a few preliminary matters, uh, CLE credit has been approved uh, for both Minnesota and California. Uh, I will provide the relevant information in the comment section as we get going. Uh, if you are seeking California credit, you will need to reach out to ACS to get the uh, required information for that. We have reserved some time for some questions, uh, which you can submit in the comment section, and please feel free to do so throughout the event, and Justice McKaig will answer them accordingly. Uh, before I hand it off, I would absolutely be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the death of Dante Wright. The Twin Cities community uh, is once again reeling after the death of another young Black man at the hands of the police during a traffic stop. Uh, this comes as we as a nation and the local community are reliving the death of George Floyd through the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin only a few miles away from the death of Dante Wright. This has only compounded the trauma, fear, pain, and anger being felt in our communities. And as the members of the American Minnesota St. Paul, I mean, Minneapolis St. Paul chapter of the American Constitution Society, we will continue to work every day to do our part to help our community heal and to learn from this tragedy. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for being here. This is going to be an incredible event. Justice McKegg is a very, very a uh, well-spoken person and she's very entertaining. But I will hand that off to a fellow board member, uh, Brandon Elkire, who will introduce uh, our today's featured guest. Thank you all. You're muted, Brandon. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our main speaker this morning, Awanakwe, Mist Woman, from the Migazee or Eagle Clan, also known as Justice Ann McCaig from the Minnesota Supreme Court. Now, Justice McCaig is a descendant of the White Earth Nation. She is the first Native American to sit on any Supreme Court in U.S. history. Justice McCaig has many accolades in her long distinguished career. This morning, I'm going to highlight just a few before we start. First, she completed her undergrad at the St. Catherine University. She then earned her Juris Doctorate from Hamlin School of Law. She went on to serve as the Assistant County, Hennepin County Attorney for 16 years handling child protection cases, adoption matters, and speciality cases that fall under the provisions of the Indian Child Welfare Act. She then served as the district court judge in Hennepin County for nine years being, before being nominated to the Minnesota Supreme Court in 2016. In her career, Justice McCaig is making a difference in many areas of court systems, including court policy and process. She's a champion and pioneer in areas of domestic violence, child protection, ICWA, while maintaining a devotion to creating equity and inclusion for underserved populations. Her efforts have led to many great accomplishments that are now best practices in Minnesota district courts. 
Today, she's a member of the Speakers Bureau for Zero Abuse Project, a board member for Proof Alliance, which is a Minnesota, Indian, or Minnesota organization on fetal alcohol syndrome, a board member for the Division of Indian Work, a board member for in the Infinity Project, a trustee for St. Catherine University, and a member of the Tribal Court State Forum, to name a few. She also serves on several national committees which address domestic violence, child abuse, and diversity. In her spare time, she's helping to train the next generation of lawyers as an adjunct professor at St. Thomas School of Law, where she co-authored a law school curriculum entitled Child Abuse and the Law. She's a proud mother of five and a Johnny Cash super fan. Now, I don't know how you all did this before your 35th birthday, but I'm very proud to introduce my friend, mentor, and boss, Justice Ann McKay. Buju, I mean, miigwech, chi miigwech, Brandon, and miigwech, Adam. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, when I hear someone do this um, this biography of me, it's it's uh, I'm always like, well, who is that? Um, because it seems like it's just been a flash in time and sort of what I want to talk about today is just really that none of us actually get anywhere alone. We all know that, but what can that process look like? What did it look like for me? And um, hopefully that will give you some um, inspiration of what it can look like for you. And I do welcome a lot of questions um, at the end. And so with that, I'm just going to sort of start with the question that I receive the most is really um, how or when did I decide that I wanted to be a lawyer? And I honestly did not give that question much thought until I got onto the Supreme Court because it's the question that I am asked most often and generally by youth. I was speaking to a group of Native students yesterday at one of our high schools virtually up north where I'm from, and they uh, asked me this question again. And so it just sort of brings me back to, well, how, it, how is it that I decided to be a lawyer? Um, and it, uh, it, it just makes me think about growing up on the reservation. I'm from a very small town. Those of you have heard, who have heard me speak before know that I always bring up Federal Dam, Minnesota, located on the Leech Lake Reservation, population about 106, 107 when I am home. Um, it is the place that I will forever call home. It is a place where my heart and soul uh, remain, even though I don't live there anymore. My family still lives Lives there and it's a place that I go back to often. But growing up on the reservation um, in a uh, pretty humble beginnings, I um, am the only daughter uh, of my mother, Cecilia, and my father, Monty. And so it starts obviously with them. Uh, and just to give you just an insight or a look, I guess, into what my family upbringing was like, I'm going to just start, start a little bit with my, with my um, father. My dad was known as Big Dog, Monty McKegg, and he was uh, born at an Indian Health Services Hospital in Onagam, Minnesota, which is in Northwest Minnesota. And he is a person who um, loved the outdoors and was really in touch with uh, Mother Earth and, and um, believed in very simple, a very simple life. He was a quiet guy. He didn't really say a whole lot, but when he spoke, he sort of had this booming authority. And for me, he was a person who commanded respect really just by walking into a room. And as the only daughter, you can imagine that I looked up to him immensely. He valued education, but I think that he believed more that people needed to really be able to get their hands dirty and do some form of physical labor in order for you to sort of hold any really uh, true water with him. Um, that was very important to him, that there be a very strong worth work ethic, as well as a, somebody who was there to help out people who needed assistance. And so he grew up in this federal dam area. And um, 
he is, uh, my grandmother would talk about how he would jump the train. She was a school teacher, his school teacher, and it was in a one room school, but he would often jump the train and go home and he would be found fishing or swimming or doing all of the things that he loved to do rather than actually being at school. And for my grandmother, that was a great frustration for her, but that's just really sort of what he valued. And so, at, and then my take my mother, my mother grew up in Bemidji, Minnesota, which which is only about 45 miles away from Federal Dam, but it's a bigger city, um, not, not huge by any means, not like the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Population's probably around 10,000 now. But she grew up um, really with a strong desire to attend college. And my grandfather was a pilot and my grandmother was a homemaker and then she also worked in the clothing industry um, as a salesperson. And so, but my mother just had these dreams of she was gonna be going off to college. And my grandmother talks about how she never understood where she got that inspiration from or that desire or um, what she thought of as sort of the audacity to think that she was gonna leave this Bemidji area and go off to college, let alone how was she going to pay for it. But my mother was very invested in this idea and she wanted to attend St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota, where it was an all women's college. And she did. She was a very strong student. Um, she really valued education. And I think she saw it as a window of or a way to uh, create opportunity or freedom of choice. Um, and then also an ability to actually give back to her home community. So she went off, attended St. Catherine University, did quite well there, graduated with honors. She was a Fulbright scholar. She ended up going over to Germany and teaching English um, and spent a few years there. She had this desire to enter the Peace Corps. And I think sort of the, the big dream and big picture of just making a difference in the world. Um, and it was only after she met my dad that uh, those plans changed as often happens to many of us. And they married and uh, and ended up having a family and moving back up north. They lived in the Twin Cities for a couple of years, but I think my mom got sick of driving back up north every weekend. And so finally she gave in and they, we moved back up north. And so my, um, they married in 1964 and my first very mediocre brother um, was born in 65. And then my second mediocre brother in 66, an angel from heaven fell in 67, that would be me. And then two more mediocre brothers followed in 70 and 73. Um, so I am the middle girl. I'm, my brothers hate that I have this opportunity to speak to people because I always make fun of them, but it's, uh, it's called giving back because I certainly endured enough of their uh, crap during the years. Um, so as growing up, I had both this work ethic and then I had a mother who really was pushing me towards this plan of education and that it was really uh, not a question of whether I was going to go, it was where was I going to go. And so I um, started work when I was young, I was 13 years old and I was a dishwasher and I ended up doing some cooking, I was a waitress, I cleaned cabins, I cleaned toilets, I mopped floors. I was a bartender. I delivered what was then called The Grit, um, which was a newspaper, a little, little local newspaper that I would deliver around the town. And um, I put all that money aside because I knew that I really wanted to attend college. And frankly, I knew that my parents were not going to be able to help because we had very simple beginnings. I grew up in a trailer house that we placed on this property of about uh, 40 acres that my dad had gotten for $1,000. And so we, I grew up in this trailer house in a very simple life. We had three gardens and we hunted and we fished and it was a really great childhood as far as freedom and independence. And I certainly knew that we did not have a lot of money but I can also honestly say that I didn't know how challenging it was. Although I knew that my mother worried about how the bills were gonna be paid from time to time. Um, but now when I'm looking back, I can only really appreciate the little money that we had um, compared to especially those around. I, I think that my mother would say that in our very plush days or the days where she felt like it was a little bit easier, I think at the most she said around 25,000 a year for a family of seven, which if you can imagine, I'm sure that that was a struggle. So 
growing up in the small town on the reservation in, a, in somewhat of an isolated area, it was um, in high school where I started to think about whether what I wanted to do. And we had to do this career day, which I'm sure many of you have done, or maybe they don't do that anymore. I don't know. But it was what did I want to be? And I had decided that I wanted to be a dentist. Because I in thinking about people that I liked or that inspired me, we had a really nice dentist. And I guess that's probably why I decided I wanted to be a dentist. So I did this report, it was great. Um, but I realized during that process that it involved a lot of science. And I just really detest science. And I just wasn't very good at it. It didn't come to me naturally. So I decided that being a dentist was not going to be for me and I needed to come up with something else. And it was during that time that I know that I decided that I was going to be a lawyer, but I don't know why I decided that. Um, I've tried to think about it. I've tried to look back in my brain and clear out the cobwebs, but it's hard for me to remember why I made that decision because I didn't know any lawyers. Um, I didn't know any judges. I, uh, I didn't have a lot of television if you can imagine everyone I had one channel um, we did have public tv but that was like masterpiece theater and things that I did not find interesting although my mom would make us watch every once in a while so tv couldn't have influenced me because really what I watched was a lot of Lawrence Welk and Hee Haw and for those of you who don't know what those shows are which I'm afraid it's probably more of you than I would like to guess I give you an assignment to google Hee Haw and uh, you will sort of get a flavor of what my television influence was. Um, but I, I, I enjoyed watching that sort of television because it was a lot of country music. And frankly, um, if I could have been anything that I wanted, it was that I wanted to be a country music singer and I wanted to head to Nashville. And so I actually did teach myself guitar, although I can't say that I was very good at it. And I actually did enter some local talent contests, uh, none of which I won, I might add. And I also sang in the choir at high school and did some singing there because I was sure that I was going to be this star uh, in Nashville, although my mom... Um, didn't seem to think so, but I, I think I could have made it, you know. Um, I go out walking after midnight out in the moonlight, just like we used to do. I'm always walking after midnight searching for you. Thank you very much. This is a little harder to do virtually because I can't really gauge the response, but you know, feel free to put in the chat that you think I could have made it in Nashville so I can send those comments to my mom. Um, but my mom was smart and she just said, um, you know, it's, it would be a good idea for you to pursue your education. And then if you still want to be a singer in Nashville, well, then certainly by all means. And so I uh, went off to college and I followed in her footsteps and I went to St. Catherine's University. And I had this conversation yesterday with some of the students because they said, what were the barriers or something or anything that would have held you back from going to college? And I said, it was really hard to leave my hometown and to leave that whole area without feeling like I was becoming a traitor because growing up, you know, um, people from the Twin Cities were not necessarily seen as um, some as a positive thing. My dad used to always say, oh, the tourists come and they, you know, they leave their trash and take our fish. And so I was always afraid that if I left home that I was going to be sort of seen as this, um, as a, as a trader. And so it was really hard for me to leave and go to college. And I felt completely out of place from my hometown where, you know, it's quiet and it's dark um, and there's no traffic to the Twin Cities where it seemed loud and there were all these lights and I mean, traffic, oh my God. I mean, I was sure that I was gonna die in a traffic accident given how people were driving down here. So it was, um, it was hard to come to the Twin Cities but I knew that if I wanted to be a lawyer that this was just one step in the process. And so I um, pursued that and I ended up staying at St. Catharines and I was supported certainly sort of this transition from my mother being an influence influential figure, female figure, to the nuns at St. Catharines. And they were very inspiring and they were very, um, very kind in sort of helping shape or influence my, my confidence or lack thereof, because I didn't necessarily see myself as any sort of a community leader, but they sort of instilled or, or built upon my um, desire to do 
to help the world and said, you know, not only is that sort of a obligation for all of us, but that all of us have these qualities within us and it's sort of bringing those qualities out. And so they really helped build my confidence in what it could be to be a strong woman who has a voice and who has the ability to impact um, the world around me. And so I am very grateful to St. Catharines for that because it was a tough transition for me from my hometown to this very different environment. And, and over time, I was able to make sort of a comfortable home there. And then of course, what happens is, you know, college is done and it's time to move on to the next step, which was law school. And so I um, really struggled then from going to college to law school, even though it was in the Twin Cities, it was still leaving a comfortable environment and then entering a whole new world where I didn't know anybody. Um, it was a new school, new environment, new surroundings, and sort of like feeling that I'm back in that ditch of not feeling comfortable. And um, when I think about my law school experience, you know, people talk about how they, oh, they loved law school. I, I got to be honest with you, I did not enjoy law school. I did not like law school. Uh, it was a means to an end. I will say that I'm so grateful for about the six, I found a group of six friends, there were seven of us total. And if it hadn't been for them, it really would have been a tough three years, but we sort of had things in common amongst ourselves. So we formed our own little group, which I'm sure many of you do. And it really made law school much more tolerable and even fun on occasion. And so I was able to make it through law school. And then it was really just time to get a job. Now I had worked all the way from College, through college and through law school because I had to. And that's not always easy as those of you who know who are sort of balancing multiple things. But I was working for the Army Corps of Engineers because uh, someone that I admired up north had helped me get this job in the Twin Cities. And it was what was considered a permanent job. And so when I left law school, it was time to change and to get a, um, a law you know, related job, which meant I was going to again leave so this family of friends, one of whom is one of my very best friends, Debbie, that I met through the Corps of Engineers, um, and move on to a whole new world again. And that was again sort of that feeling of uncomfortableness and what was that going to look like for me and what was that going to mean. And so I ended up getting a job in the Hennepin County Attorney's Office and I was really afraid to take that job because it was temporary at the time and I wasn't sure what that was going to mean for me. And I was worried about how I was going to pay the bill because if that job didn't turn into something permanent, I would have let my permanent job go at the Army Corps of Engineers and then where was I going to be? And I didn't want to have to um, go back up north with, you know, my tail between my legs in not having been able to sustain or take care of myself. So that was a really... Um, frightening decision for me. But I'm really glad that I took the leap because I had no idea what the office was about. But Mike Freeman gave me the chance. And he hired me despite the fact that I wasn't the flashiest. You know, I wasn't the top of my law school class. Um, I didn't have any sort of a you know, stellar uh, resume, but he gave me a shot because I think he saw just my determination and my grit. And so I really appreciate that. And I never forget him. And I forever am grateful to him for giving me that chance. And so I started in what was the child protection division. And again, I didn't really know what that was. Um, it was a job. But the moment that I landed in that division, which is where the county was representing the local social service agency in child welfare matters, I knew that I was in the right place. It sort of felt, the work felt immediately comfortable. It, it sort of gave life to um, some of the things that I had witnessed growing up, you know, in my hometown. Um, in fact, one of my, one of the people that I knew very well, you know, her friend her her parents were quite abusive. And I was trying to put that in some form of context for me because I had really good parents, but I knew that her home life was just very different. And this sort of helped me take that structure and training of law and education and put into context some of the things that I had seen growing up including a lot of the kids in the area who always really went to my mother for advice and counsel and support. Um, and so I felt comfortable working in that division, not to mention there was a lot of really strong women in that division, some of whom who took me under their wing and sort of helped, you know, guide me as I was learning this very new job in a very new environment. And it was in that context that of, of which I was working in the county attorney's office, where there was this um, uh, there was this announcement that the very first Native American 
male was going to be appointed and sworn in to the Hennepin County District Court bench. So it was the first native guy in the Twin Cities who would be appointed to a district court bench. And I just remember thinking, wow, I mean, this is amazing. And so not knowing what that was about, I actually went and stood in the back of a room and watched this swearing in process of this individual whose name was Robert Blazer. And he was also from the White Earth Nation. So I felt this immediate connection to him. And watching him and the process of being sworn in, the formality, um, sort of all of the things that go along with that process, it was inspiring. I have to admit that it's the first time that I thought, well, if this Native guy from the White Earth Nation can become a judge, uh, perhaps one day it is something that I could do as well. And I don't know that I would have necessarily thought about that had I not seen him be sworn in. And then as luck would have it, he actually came down and was the presiding judge in our juvenile court where I was representing social workers. So I had this chance to appear before him on a regular basis. And um, that's sort of where this new mentor mentee relationship began, even though I don't know that I necessarily appreciated the fact that I needed a mentor like him. Um, he definitely saw that I needed it. And it was my time in the county attorney's office and the fact that he was on the bench where I think we were able to do just some really great work around um, issues affecting the Native community. Because as many of you know, you know, Native youth are still there in out-of-home placement. The numbers are off the charts um, in their disparities. And unfortunately, that just sort of goes all the way across the board. And so it was an opportunity for Native people in our different capacities to work towards setting up an infrastructure that would actually, I think, bridge the gap between a lack of trust and communication between tribal government and my fellow Native people in the community and the, and the court system or, or the government itself. And it's not always easy. I will certainly say that there were times um, and struggles in that job where people in my own community thought that I was a traitor or that I was a sellout. Um, and so it was personally challenging for me. But at the same time, I felt very strongly that in order for us to ever move forward with change, we sort of have to have representation on all sides. It's like, you know, the table where you need four legs to make it a solid table or a solid chair. And if we just have just a, a siloed view, um, we're not necessarily going to perhaps affect or impact uh, change as we wish. And so for me, um, the county attorney position, it's a very powerful position. It's a position that has a lot of authority. And so being able to work in that capacity towards uh, change was, was really, um, it was one of my favorite jobs. I'll forever love that job. Not to mention, it allowed me to work with uh, other members of my community towards that change, including Judge Blazer. And I can remember there was a hearing once where um, he was the judge and he said, I just want to stop for a moment. He's like, and I want everyone in the courtroom to look around. And, and we're sort of like, what is he doing? And we're looking at each other. And he said, you know, what do you see? And um, we didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, every professional in this courtroom is native. He was, his law clerk was, uh, I was as the county attorney, the person representing the parents was, there was a guardian ad litem in court who was native, and obviously the native family who was appearing before him. And he's like, this is a beautiful moment that I want us to just sort of all recognize because it is so incredibly unusual. And it is something that we have so we have a lot to be proud of. And he's right. And it was sort of that moment where he I sort of saw how one person can make such a difference, which was him, because he was a founding, one of the founding members of the Minnesota American Indian Bar Association. And he took the responsibility of being a mentor very seriously. And he, I don't think he ever turned down or didn't seize an opportunity to try to help mold or advance or support uh, other young native lawyers um, who he came in contact with. And I certainly was a beneficiary of that. 
and you know he would call me back into chambers often and he'd be like you know mckay get back in chambers and i'd be like oh god what did i do now and he would say you know you don't roll your eyes in the courtroom and i'd roll my eyes at him saying don't roll your eyes and he would say you know you don't argue things twice to the court you know you argue them once to the court and in my head i'm going well you know i had to because you clearly didn't hear me the first time and you know sort of that really uh, unbridled passion that I had to be a lawyer and he really wanted to sort of harness that not to change me but to just sort of soften some of those rough edges because you know he had plans for me and I, I didn't know that um, but I certainly appreciate all of the effort that he put in and I always am uh, tease him and say, yeah, my mom really appreciated those efforts as well, because I was a handful for sure. Uh, and I can remember asking him one day, he said, so do you think that I could be a judge? And he was like, no, you know, he's like, not unless you change, you know, and, and start listening to me. And I was like, well, that's kind of harsh. Uh, but it, it, I took him very seriously. And it was uh, sort of maturing in my profession as being able to look at myself honestly and see the things that I needed to change or needed to improve and then also being just comfortable with the other things about myself and who I was and not feeling like I necessarily had to change everything about me and he was really good at just sort of helping me strike that balance I think and so I I started to take his advice much more seriously um, and it doesn't mean that there weren't continued struggles because even in my time in the county attorney's office you know, uh, there's always room for advancement where you move from being a line attorney to perhaps being a supervising attorney. And I can remember having a conversation uh, and it was very clear to me that I was not going to be moved forward as any sort of a supervisory, in a supervisory capacity in that division because the person who was directly supervising me um, she said that uh well she just didn't appreciate my communication style because i'm a little i'm a little new york not always minnesota and for her i think that just was a struggle and she didn't instead of trying to work with me i think she just really was going to block me on that and that was frustrating to me because i knew that i was a hard worker and i knew that um if there was a really tough case that came in they didn't have an issue with assigning that case to me so it was hard because it's sort of this brick wall that was built um, where I felt like I wasn't going to be able to necessarily break through that. And so then what do you do? Um, and so I would go and talk to Judge Blazer about that. And he was really good about, well, that's just temporary. And, you know, let's think about what to do about that. And don't let that be something that stops you from trying to progress however it is that you decide to move forward. And that was really helpful to me because it can be hard when you've got people who really you think should be supporting you or helping you or encouraging you and they and they don't. But that's going to happen with all of us in our careers as we move forward. And so there was a time then where I did make it to the district court bench, and that was in 2008. I was appointed by our then Governor Tim Pawlenty to the bench. And it was, again, another one of those moments where you move from a very comfortable environment to a new environment, and it's like you're instantly sort of an outcast. I was no longer going to be a, you know, a trial lawyer, and so they sort of put me over here because it's like, well, you're going to be on the court, and it sort of immediately changes that relationship. And I wasn't yet accepted as part of the bench because I hadn't really started the job yet. And so I felt really isolated. I mean, really, really alone. And I can remember at the at the press conference, um, first of all, just a little funny story. You know, one of the things that Governor Pawlenty asked me was, how do we know that you're going to stay humble? Because of course, we have issues with, with people who get on the bench and, and that changes people. And I was like, oh, huh, you just have to come to my house um, because my family does not care one iota what it is that I am doing for work. And that has maintained for sure. Because when I, I was trying to tell my family that I'd gotten this call from the governor and he appointed me to the district court bench and nobody was listening to me. And finally I said, did you hear me? You know, and they said, well, what does that mean for us? And I'm like, well, we have to go to a press conference tomorrow. And they're like, well, do we have to go? And do we have to dress up? And, you know, it just sort of all began there. And I appreciate that about my family though, because it does sort of make you, uh, you can't get too, 
you're, you're I'm not going to get too big for my britches. That's for sure. Because my family just, you know, I have one role with them and that's just being their mom. In fact, my daughter was texting me as she knew I was coming on here. And she's like, I forgot my laptop. I need you to bring it to school. And I'm like, well, I cannot, I'm actually doing my job at the moment. So I cannot bring you your laptop, but going to that press conference, it was uh, a moment where you get that buyer's remorse. And I thought, what on earth have I done? Do I really belong on the bench? And why am I leaving a job that I love and that I know how to do and that I'm comfortable with? And there, there's people that I like who, you know, some who support me, others who don't, but for the most part. Um, and it was tough. It was another tough transition. But again, you sort of find your people and you find your sea legs and it's, it stabilizes, it sort of steadies out. And so um, I, it took me a while, but I did find some comfort on the bench. And I also had to become a little more comfortable with it. I don't have to change myself. Um, you know, if I don't want to go to some of the social gatherings, I call it forced socialization. I don't have to. You know, if I want to put my family first and my kids soccer games and instead of going to some function, that's okay. And sort of giving myself that permission. And I really, really enjoyed my time on the district court bench, um, having that daily interaction with, with people coming before the judiciary. And it was in 2016 that my mentor, Judge Blazer, came to me yet again. And he told me that there was going to be this opening on the Minnesota Supreme Court. And I was excited because I thought he was going to apply as this leading uh, native individual within our legal community. He would be the perfect choice. And he said, I am not going to apply. You are going to apply. And frankly, I thought he'd lost his mind. Uh, because I didn't consider myself the material uh, to be on the Minnesota Supreme Court. I mean, I felt like I was stretching it with getting on the district court because, you know, I'm a jokester and I believe in having fun. And while I, I love the work of the district court, um, I just felt like those were, you know, I'm much more comfortable in that environment. I didn't see myself with um, the people that I, saw sort of up there on the Minnesota Supreme Court. And he was um, very stern with me. And he said, you know, this isn't about you. He's like, this is about our community. And the fact that we need a seat at the table, it's time, and you're going to be it. And really sort of reminding me of my obligation to the larger community. And so I was like, well, all right, I mean, I'll apply, but I really didn't think that it was going to go anywhere. And lo and behold, you know, it did. And I can still remember when Governor Dayton called me, I was by myself driving in the car and the phone rings and it says Governor Dayton. And I was like, this, this can't be true because you know, if the governor's calling you, it's generally you. And, um, you know, he's like, can you keep a secret? And I thought, do I answer that honestly? Because that would be no. And I said, yes. <laughs> and then he said, I want to appoint you to the Supreme Court. And it's, um, it's a really odd feeling because you, in that moment for me, it was, you know, what is Federal Dam going to think? Are they going to think, boy, she's really sold out now because she's now really, you know, cement in the Twin Cities? Um, what was my family going to think? Um, were they going to be okay with this? Were they not going to be okay with this? Uh, what was the legal community going to think? Were they going to question whether I was smart enough to be on the Minnesota Supreme Court? And then most importantly to me, what was the Indian community going to think? Was it going to be okay with them that I was going to be the one and I knew that I was going to be the first female in all of the United States. And it was an overwhelming responsibility that just smacked me upside the head. And, and also, again, you leave, leaving a place that I'd found sort of this home and comfortable to a whole new place um, in, in St. Paul, which was very intimidating. And, um, 
and so I made that transition and it's not been an easy one. Uh, and it's not because of my colleagues on the Minnesota Supreme Court because they have been really wonderful. Um, one in particular, which is Justice David Lillehog, who unfortunately retired. Um, it would have been even a greater struggle if it wasn't for him because he, uh, Judge Blazer went to him and was like, okay, I'm done with her. You know, I've done my job. I'm handing her off to you. And I don't think Justice Lillehog knew what that meant um, because, you know, I can be a handful still. But he took on that job and supported me and really, I think, allowed me to be who I am and, um, and valued my contribution let it and let it be different than others because I am not the same. And being on this court, I very much felt even more isolated than before. I can remember being in the very first couple of hearings and conferences where I thought, I don't know what these people are talking about. I don't know what a lot of these words mean. Um, and I thought, I don't know that I have the intellectual horsepower that is similar or the same to my colleagues on this court because they are incredible and I it's not you know it's sort of that lack of confidence that just sort of you know um, leaks in even despite my best efforts and uh, it was Justice Lillehog who was sort of like you don't have to be like everybody else but even with his support, as well as the other makeup of the court, you know, we have Justice Chudich, who is the first openly gay justice, and she's supportive. And I've got Justice Hudson, who is um, who's who's African American, and she is supportive. And sort of, we have all these, you know, little pockets where you have things in common. And I think that's really what you have to draw yourself to. But even that, I still was sort of putting myself in a position where I wasn't very happy, and I didn't feel very comfortable, and during my time of even thinking about getting on the court, I had uh, sent a letter to Sonia Sotomayor because she's someone that I just really admire and I had read her book and it was like listening to me. I mean, listening to her words, I thought, okay, I mean, I can see myself in her life and look at where she is. And so she was a true inspiration for me that someone like her who grew up in the projects, um, could make it to where she is and she just seems so authentic and so I'd written her a letter and it was one day that I was sort of moping around and I came back and um, my uh, support staff she said you know you received a call from uh, Sonia Sotomayor's chambers and I was like what uh, and they said she was coming to town and that she wanted to meet me and that was an incredible moment because here I am just, you know, Ann McKegg from Federal Dam, Minnesota, and Sonia Sotomayor from the United States Supreme Court wants to meet me. And that was just incredible. And so I had the chance to meet her. It was very brief, but I took that chance and I said, you know, do you ever feel like you don't belong? And she was very serious and just said every day and she's like you're where you're supposed to be and you're going to go back there and you're going to do that job and you know and you're going to do that job well and it was just sort of this incredible infusion of confidence and a kick in the butt that I really needed and it sort of just snapped me back into well all right if Sonia Sotomayor says that I can do it, well, then perhaps I can. And I am forever grateful. I don't even know if she knows just how that was the words that I needed in that very moment. Um, and I think that that sort of speaks to what mentoring can do for us, because it is even with people who have really, you know, good self-worth and are strong in confidence, we all still have these moments where you feel vulnerable or you feel incapable or you feel like you don't belong. And I think that we need to create a space where it's just so much um, easier to talk about those things rather than seen as a weakness because 
it's only through those conversations that I had with people who supported me and came around me that I've been able to sort of continue to, um, you know, progress or to move into different positions where I feel like I can make a difference. And it doesn't have to be the exact same difference that others on around you are making. You know, I've learned that perhaps my value is just that I can be an inspiration to, you know, youth of color who can see something in me that is like themselves, who perhaps grew up, you know, without a lot of money and who grew up in a trailer house and, you know, in a very simple beginnings. And yet I have, you know, went to college and I'm here and I've got this great job. Um, and what an opportunity, because I tell you, I don't know that I even could have um, understood what, what that, what that meant for, for youth, because we've gotten calls here at the court and some of them are from kids that I removed when they were young and they'll have an issue. You know, there was a, a set of siblings that called me and there. They said, you know, we uh, were sexually abused when we were kids and you removed us from our home and the individual who sexually abused us is getting out and they've done it to someone else and they want to call us as a witness and we need a lawyer, but we don't know where to go. And, you know, those are not calls that you normally get at the Supreme Court, but those are the kinds of calls that I get, which to me speaks to the need to have individuals in these positions. Um, and I'm so happy that these kids feel like they can call. And I do everything within my power to at least get them to someone who can help them. And, um, and it, perhaps that's where my value is. And so trying to, um, see and feel good about that without you know you don't want to become arrogant that's for sure i at least don't i mean I, well i don't know anybody who says they want to be arrogant of course i don't want to be arrogant but it's only through that richness of i think our diversity on the bench where we get the full um 360 degree view and our decisions are just so much better because of it because we each have something unique to offer and if that's different, that's just perfectly okay. Um, and it's hard to find that that level of comfort, especially when others perhaps think that you maybe shouldn't be the one. And certainly um, there were those who didn't think that I should be the one. And um, But we have to have that balance of being brave and I think being courageous and that it's okay to fall down, you know, just get yourself back up and don't close the door on yourself. Um, make others close the door or try to close the door on you. And when they do that, you know, get your toe in there and just kick that door back open because um, only through those efforts will we ever be able to advance the law and the criminal justice system in a way that is going to be meaningful and in a way that is really going to impact the lives of those who have to come before um, the judiciary because it's never a great day for, for them. And I um, just am going to and by saying, I always go back to Sonia Sotomayor because she's my inspiration. And I just love what she says when she says, in every position that I've been in, there have been naysayers who don't believe that I'm qualified or who don't believe that I can do the work. And I feel a special responsibility to prove them wrong. All of you can do it. There isn't anything that you can't do should you put your mind to it. And so I encourage you all to reach out, find those supportive individuals around you because we're all here for you, just as those who have been there for me. Um, I am going to do all that I can to help others. And so think of her words whenever you're feeling bad um, and just take the the opportunity to pro prove those who think you can't do it wrong. And I hope that uh, this is, you found something helpful in this. And I think that uh, Adam, we can actually start to take questions if that's okay. Yeah, so thank you. Um, but we have a question here. Um, are you able to see that? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. But do you wanna read it so that everybody else can see? Yes, so uh, the question is, uh, what do you tell young women or any woman who struggles with the same lack of self-confidence? 
We often hear men never think twice about applying for jobs that they are not qualified for. Women underestimate their qualifications and value. How do we change that? Well, you know, that is so true. And I think we change that by, by looking to other women and and men you know i mean i was incredibly supported by both justice lillahog and by judge blazer and many other men but also many very powerful women and i think that for the women we have uh, an opportunity to really help support each other and um it's one of the things that i like like about the women's lawyers groups because it is a unique it's a unique um experience that i'm not sure that everyone else can appreciate as to what it is like and the challenges of being a woman because i do think that we doubt ourselves and yet if you think about it um you know <laughs> i always go back to i would love to see my husband give birth i mean that just would be downright comical because while i was giving birth i know that all he said was i'm hungry and i'm tired and i'm thinking yeah, well, why don't you, let's switch places here. Um, and by God, if we can give birth to children or raise children, then certainly there isn't anything that we can't do, but we need to continue to tell ourselves that and tell each other that, um, and just create that blanket of support around each other and, and, and do it mindfully and purposefully. I don't think that it just happens naturally. I think we have to really be thoughtful about it but it's a great question. So everyone, please feel free to uh, continue to submit your questions here. Um, here's a question for you. Any comments or suggestions for pre-law students? Yeah, I mean, law school today is really an incredible investment. Um, just when I look at it from the financial per perspective. And what I would suggest is that if you are thinking that you want to go to law school, I would encourage you to go to one of the law schools and actually perhaps sit in a course or two, especially now that things are virtual in a lot of places, it's a little bit easier. And also then go and, and watch some lawyers in action. I wish I had been able to do that because I think it would have made my law school experience much better had I realized um, how exciting it was going to be at the end when I actually got to be a litigator. So I would just be really thoughtful about that process to ensure that because you might find there are some people who find like, oh, I don't like that at all. But there's lots of different ways that you can use the law. But I would encourage you to to really reach out and sort of um, go and, and watch some of these ex these jobs and the different professions to see where you fit in that because it'll it'll, I think, inspire you to either to go to law school or it will be like, no, that's actually not what I want to do. It'll create clarity. Okay, I think we have another question. And just as an aside, by the way, when my wife was uh, giving delivery, I was hungry too. And I See? still hear to it till the end of the end of time. So well, it's like the most ridiculous thing ever. You're tired and hungry, please. <laughs> Don't ask her about it. Uh, so I have another question here. So can you talk about being a mother in the legal profession? How can the profession better support mothers? Yeah, um, that's a great question because I'm not so sure that we do that very well still. It's sort of seen as uh, a detriment that if, oh, if you're a mom, that means that you're going to perhaps take off more time from work and it's finding an employer who values that. And I will say, uh, again, I got to give props to Mike Freeman because I, I felt very supported in that office uh, that being a mother was a number one priority and that there was a true appreciation of what that meant. Um, so much so that they were very flexible in how to um, take time off and to take enough time off once I had given birth and then being welcomed back like this was there was no shame in in that whole process but I know that not all employers are going to feel that way but again getting women into those positions of leadership and being the decision makers are sort of how you start to force those changes from the top down, which is why we really need to uh, promote ourselves into all of those varying positions. Okay, another great question here. Do you think clerking is a valuable experience for someone who wants to be a judge? And imposter syndrome, do you have any advice on how to overcome that feeling on a daily basis? 
Okay, first question. Yes, clerking is an amazing opportunity. Adam can even speak to that. Adam got to be a law clerk for a while, as did um, Brandon. And being a clerk is you just really see, you see really good lawyering, you see not so great lawyering, it helps you figure out the things that you want to do and the things that you don't want to do. It also helps you sort of see the um, behind the scenes and what happens and how a judge thinks. And, and again, I think that it's seeing a judge from a very different position than appearing before. I would, I wished I would have had the clerking opportunity because I think I could have been a much better lawyer and it would have also created much more clarity as to what a judge does uh, because I certainly had a very different view of what a judge does compared to what they actually do. And I think that is ever changing, but yeah, it's an incredible opportunity. And then how to sort of overcome the imposter syndrome. It's really reassuring yourself every day. You know, I'm not very good at, I'm not uh, a person who journals. I'm not a person who does a whole lot of self-reflection. Um, I use humor a lot to sort of support myself. But again, you've, you get this supportive en environment around you and people are going to um, help you. Now, obviously, you don't want to have to call every day and be like, Adam, tell me how great I am and tell me that I should really be where I am. So you sort of got to find that within yourself. But, but um, it is that self-belief. And if you need to tell yourself every morning that you got this, well, then that's what you need to do. Okay, we have several more questions. Um, well, chop, chop, Adam. <laughs> sorry. Uh, this one here, what personal characteristic or quality do you see that has been your secret weapon in your career path? Uh, something that others may not have valued. Oh, uh, maybe yeah. your singing. It could be your singing. It, well, for sure, my singing, clearly. <laughs> my mother, even today, if you could all write a note to my mother, that'd be great. Um, I, I, I think it's my sense of humor. Certainly during my career, there have been times where it has been criticized that I don't take things serious enough. And I have always responded in that, of course, I take things serious when they need to be serious, but that I am not a serious person. And it's just me being who I am and being comfortable with that and knowing that some people are going to criticize that but I value my sense of humor I think it what it's what gets me through the day certainly I've had lots of tragedy within my own family and if I didn't have that sense of humor um, I wouldn't have survived as well okay I guess I don't know if we'll have enough time for this question what didn't you like about law school Oh God, everything. I don't like its competitive nature. Um, I did not like the, the method, the Socratic method of let's try to shame students. I think that's insane. I think we should be supporting students. Um, I don't, I didn't like, you know, there's lots of traditional classes that are helpful, but I think students now have a much greater breadth of what they can take the classes that you know are probably much more helpful at least in my mind um, and just being much more accepting that there's all different kinds of students and that you don't have to be a straight a student in order to be successful because i assure you that when i back went back and looked at my law school grades i laughed out loud because i was not at the top of my class and frankly i'm a little proud of that Okay, this is a really good question. How do you deal with cases before the court that maybe touch on tribal rights or environmental issues? Do you feel you bring a different perspective to those cases? Is that welcomed? What, uh, what's it like when your difference could sort out of become a central issue in the case? Yeah, that's a tough one because, um, you know, you obviously bring with you who you are and you never want to leave that by the roadside because I think that sort of is the human element that sometimes is missing in the law um, and it's incredibly important, but you also have to be very mindful that it cannot take you completely off the point. Um, I think that my life experience has been very helpful to the it's a perfect example. We had a case um, before us, which was Lake Calhoun and changing the name to Bidet Makaska, which was written by Justice David Lilhog. And uh, there was an opportunity for me to ask a question during oral argument, which I just felt so good about. And that was just the process for the name change because the name originally was Bidet Makaska and then it was changed to Lake Calhoun. And the whole fight was about what process was used and was it fair to go from Lake Calhoun back 
back to Bidet McCoskey. And so the question really was, well, what process was used back in the day when it was changed from Bidet McCoskey to Lake Calhoun? And one of my colleagues afterwards said, only you could have asked that question and it was an important question and it was one that needed to be asked. And that felt really great. I have to say that it was personally empowering for me. Um, and I think that it was empowering for the Indian community. So we've had a couple questions that have come in about uh, mentorship and the role that it has played uh, in your career. And one of them focused on what kind of qualities you focus on as a good mentor. Um, and as well as ones, you know, have suggestions on how potential mentors can instead seek out people who need help as mentees. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One, it has to be a good fit. I think personality wise, you've got to be able to be comfortable with the individual who is going to be your mentor. And also you got to be willing to be a little more thick skinned. Like I wasn't at 25 when I first started, when Judge Blazer would sort of give me that critical um, advice, I was like, what? Like, you know, what's wrong with rolling my eyes? You know, I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm a lawyer. And being able to just sort of accept that sort of um, that feedback that is, we call it what constructive feedback feedback but from someone that you can hear it from because there's not there are certain individuals who you're just not going to hear it from or you're not going to be able to and then that's just not going to be a good match and you want somebody who's going to be honest with you because frankly if judge blazer hadn't been so painfully honest with me i would have never made some of the changes that i really did need to make and it did make me a better lawyer but you also have to have an ability to and be in a place where you can actually hear that so don't just pick somebody who's going to tell you everything that you want to hear it's got to be somebody who is really invested in Sometimes it may be, I don't think that's a, that's the, that's the good path for you. And let me tell you why, and you're still going to make the ultimate decision, but it just has to be a good fit all the way around. And as far as seeking people out, don't be afraid to go and talk to somebody. I've had lots of students, which has been great. Um, Brandon, actually, Brandon just called me up and like, let's meet. I think I met him at, a, at an event and he came up and introduced himself and then followed up with me. And we've become really good friends. And I'm so proud of all the work that he's doing. And so don't be afraid to take that initial step. If it's meant to work out, it will work out. And if it doesn't, just go right back to the table and find somebody different. Excellent. A couple more questions and we are getting close to time. We want to be respectful of, of all of that. Uh, can you talk about how you're intentional about bringing other women or Native people along now that you've reached this point? Sure. Uh, it is, it, the intentionality comes from, so for example, if you see on this court, you know, we have lots of uh, board positions that'll open up or volunteer positions to be on rules committees and be the chair or the co-chair. And when those opportunities come up, I, I think that we have a female majority, which is great. I think we try to be very mindful of who we're going to recommend to be put into those positions. And that is where you have the chance to sort of advance some individuals who have shown an interest in who you think actually um, is, is going to be able to not only do the work of the committee, but it's also going to help them um, sort of hone their skills. So it's that sort of intentionality. And then also going to places, just having the court go to places we've never been before. You know, we went to the Red Lake Nation. The court had never been to a tribal uh, high school before before and we went and spent the day there and and that you know you never know what sort of seed that's going to plant in some of the young students there but I'm happy to say that we've now had lots of young native students who have come and watched the court which had also never happened before so um, being mindful that you don't just assume that it can only be sort of drawing from one pool be very broad in where you go and go to the unusual places All right, uh, I'm going to highlight one thing that was included in the comments section just uh, briefly. The Hmong American Bar Association has a scholarship for LSAT prep course. Uh, apps are due at the end of this month. If folks here want to more info for the application, please email in the comments in the um, in And that the was from Shuli, right? It's from Shuli, yes. Yo, yo, Shuli! <laughs> so uh, if you're interested in that, please do that. I know there, it sounds like there are some, some people that are considering taking the LSAT and going to law school. So if you're interested, reach out. Um, but lastly, uh, I think this is a great question. You have mentioned, and I have read that being on the bench can be very lonely. Do you have any advice on how to prepare for that? And I guess lastly, do you have any parting thoughts for everybody as we leave this discussion today? Uh, 
how do you prepare for that? I, for me, it's I've got a really strong uh, friendship group that is outside of the legal field. And that is what keeps me sane. I can remember I, 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 when I was in the county attorney's office, it seemed like the public defenders were all marrying each other. And I thought, gosh, how does that work? Um, because I just couldn't imagine bringing all of that home with me. My husband is not a lawyer. He doesn't want to be a lawyer, although he could because he argues like one. And then my girlfriends are not either. And so I, we just have a really diverse group of friends that help keep it real and keep me from going insane from isolation for sure. And then as far as just parting thoughts, you know, um, we're in a tough time in in the world right now. And we're in a tough time here in Minnesota. And I just think that we have to um, remain steadfast. And we have to believe that there can be change and that there will be change. And it is through sometimes the toughest and darkest of times that the best sort of change can come. We have certainly seen that in the in our history in this country. Um, and so I, I encourage all of us to just take a deep breath and remain positive and remain persistent that with um, all that this country has to offer, we are going to prevail. And um, it's going to be incumbent upon all of us to do our part. All right. Well, once again, thank you so much uh, for joining us. This has been uh, quite incredible. And thank you so much. And we I want you all to see through. Adam's wedding picture, everyone. Thank you for that. Adam's, <clears throat> Adam's wedding picture. Yeah, there it is. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, and thank you so much to Justin and McKeg for, for being here today. Um, be well, everybody, and um, all the best.